Oh, sorry, I was muted. So, uh, do you see the presentation now? Yeah. You can see me waving. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, it's perfect. I can I can conclude the talk. Um, all right, so uh, so uh, the title. Um, let me let me scroll down to where we were, and um, just just give me a second. Because... All right, I'm ready. So I'm going to talk about constant time QC MDPC decoding with negligible failure rate. Uh, the usual suspects, near Drucker and Dushan Kostic and myself. Uh, I just remind uh, like a quick recap. The context is bike, the second uh, round uh, candidate for the standardization to PQC standardization uh, project. And uh, this is my favorite uh, slide. Uh, going from in CPA security to in CCA security is harsh. So what we what is needed is a decoder with a very low DFR. So this is a necessary condition for in CCA security that the DFR would be uh, at most two to the minus uh, 128 or minus uh, 192 for level three. This is uh, OK. If you heard the previous talk, this is a necessary condition. It is not uh, not always sufficient, but that problem was already solved. So now what is required for a good design with ephemeral keys would be a decoder with low enough DFR. And what is low enough? Low enough is that the failure rates are significantly smaller than the network failures, for example. And even better, they should be small enough so that there is no need to engineer for handling such failures. Uh, so we have some targets, harsh targets and maybe more lenient targets. And let's see how we uh, get them. Uh, so we must have a constant time decoder with a low, low DFR because uh, at least for in C CCA security, uh, now the, uh, the, the DFR of, the, of a decoder depends on the number of, uh, of iterations. If we want uh, it to be a constant time or uh, implementable in constant time, it must perform all the iterations. So there is no up to a certain number approach and we have the problem. So, so backflip did not specify this, but we are calling a backflip uh, plus as uh, as the decoder with a fixed number of iterations that is always uh, performed with 100 iterations it is of course uh, impractical with up to 100 iterations it is not constant time and leaks information so so we we know that we must perform all of the iterations so now uh, i'd like to discuss different extrapolations extrapolation methods so always you run experiment and calculate estimated DFRs for some points. Let's say R1, R2, up to Rn, where R is the block size uh, for the for the system. Now, what is a linear extrapolation in our definition? We generate a linear regression on a subset of these uh, of these points, and we choose the best fit where the mer merit is the is the measured uh, measured by the root mean square deviation so here is one way to do an extrapolation based on on a set of experiments another one would be a quadratic extrapolation you fit a degree to polynomial uh, to the points another uh, way would be to pick two points we call it the two points uh, uh, you need to pick the two points where you still see a significant number of errors so that you have some some kind of uh, of assurance uh, on what you are getting and then you extend it by a by a line so you can say that this is good if you assume that the the dependency of dfr uh, in r is a concave function then this would work now I'd like to show uh, to show some uh, problems indicating that you can get different results from different methods. So here is uh, so I remind that the original bike recommendation for level one was eleven thousand seven seven nine. In our paper, we actually were using the method uh, uh, that is shown on the left uh, figure. 
uh, and we approximated that the, the value needs to be 12,539. And if you are using the two points method, then uh, then you can get away with 11,813. In both cases, in our experiments, this number, the original number 11,779 was not enough. And uh, and what what is important to see in this uh, in these two figures is that you can get different so different extrapolations give you different results here, and uh, and you have some noise in the large values. So the uh, the large R in the large R values you see very few errors unless you are doing billions and billions and you accumulate enough. So the estimations get noisy. And this is why you get this, uh, why the results are sensitive to what you are actually doing with the experiments on the points and with how you are extrapolating uh, extrapolating them. In any case, eventually the latest bike actually concluded with 12,323, uh, and uh, this uh, confirms our finding that uh, the the original value was was not uh, sufficient to reach this uh, target. So, so now here is a cookbook, how to design and tune a decoder. So first of all, we have to notice that this is an optimization problem with several variables. And what are the variables or the parameters? The block size, the fixed number of iterations that you want to have in this uh, uh, decoder, the cost of an iteration for that decoder, and for every set of these three parameters, you need to do all the experiments to collect the DFR on the set of points. And after you have collected this, you need to extrapolate and shoot for the target DFR, and you have a design. And for all of these designs, after you've done this, okay, you need to choose an appealing block size versus performance balance. So here you have a cookbook. All you need now is a lot of patience in many uh, CPU hours. Um, all right, so here is an example for what we get with the black and gray decoder. And this is interesting because we show left is, uh, is the linear extrapolation, the right is the quadratic extrapolation. And, and we show how the, how the results are changed per the number of iterations, three, four, and five iterations. So the interesting thing is that between three and four iterations, you see that in both cases, the results are improving significantly. Whereas from four to five iterations, there is some improvement, but it is not a lot. And this actually is telling you that if this decoder was not successful enough to um, to get rid of uh, of errors in four iterations, then you will are going to get more or less the same results even if you add another iteration. So, so this is uh, this is what we see, and uh, basically the the results or when we shoot these extrapolations to a target of uh, two to the minus one hundred and twenty eight, we get different results. Um, of course, we'll pick the stricter one, which is the more conservative estimation. Now, another example is what happens with the backflip plus decoder. And here is something interesting. Here is the, we have uh, graphs with the linear extrapolation and the quadratic extrapolation for eight, nine, 10, and 11 iterations. And you can see that there is a difference. So it really matters uh, how many iterations you are willing to invest into the decoder's design, and this improves. And actually, actually, the underlying understanding here is that the backflip plus decoder has a better chance to fix itself. So while the black and gray decoder, if it goes astray, then you cannot fix it, the backflip can fix itself, and the results therefore improve with more iterations. But of course, there is more cost if you add the uh, performance cost, if you add more iterations. Uh, and just as a measure of com comparison, the time for nine backflip iterations is more or less the same as four black and gray iterations. So now you can see how, you can, how, how it is possible to tune this design. And let me go to a constant time uh, decoder. So this is what we did in this, uh, in this, um, 
research. And what's interesting is that we get different interesting trade-offs between our values, which is the bandwidth that we get for the KM and, uh, and the target DFR. So two points that I would like to show, and this is for the black ray decoder, uh, is the difference between three iterations and four iterations. So if we want to shoot to two to the 128, uh, with three iterations, we need R to be 12,781, and it would cost 4 million cycles. If we want to do this with five iterations, we get away with a smaller bandwidth, only 12,373, but then the cost is going to be six, four, six and a half million cycles. So you can see the trade-off. And now the question is, what is the best trade-off, or what is the difference between 4 million cycles and and a little bit higher bandwidth to six and a half million cycles and uh, and uh, a, a little bit slower ba uh, lower uh, bandwidth. So this is how we tune and design a decoder. And I just want to uh, to say to give another appealing option. So we, uh, this table shows you you can target, let's say, ten to the minus seven for the TFR or ten to the minus nine. 10 to the minus 12, you see how, how the trade-off goes. And an interesting point is 2 to the minus 64, because at 2 to the minus 64, you can really say, I, I call it loose ephemeral. You can really say that you will never really see a decoding failure uh, with ephemeral keys and uh, with, with the failure rate of 2 to the minus 64. So engineering-wise, you don't really have to even bother um, engineer towards this uh, event of a failure with this uh, failure rate. So now you can see how you can tune a decoder per the requirement for the per the target uh, DFR and the target security, whether or not you want in CCA or you can settle with the in CPA. In the end, what we did in bike was actually converge to a single proposal just for simplicity, because this was the goal to get uh, one, uh, one um, simple design. Now, the last thing I want to, to discuss is not all keys are born equal, and some of them are weak. So what we did in this uh, study, in this paper, we defined a set that we called a weak key. Weak keys that need to be considered when analyzing a DFR, the DFR of the decoder. So we found a, a set that has a non-trivial size, but fortunately, the relative size compared to the set of all keys is still negligible. So it's not a counterexample for the DFR statement, but the list, on the other hand, the, this list is not necessarily exhaustive. I say again, this, this is not a problem with ephemeral keys. And the important thing is that it is not trivial for an adversary to concoct poison ciphertext with a design that has the Fujisaki Okamoto uh, construction uh, on top of this. So, so uh, in, this is some, some kind of a comfort. And here is some result about these wikis. So F, little, um, lowercase f is a parameter that parameterizes the generation of these week, this set of wikis. Actually, this is the number of one bits that we fixed from the 71 uh, um, error positions of H0. H0 is the private key. And F equals zero is just draw a random key. And these graphs actually show for a number uh, for R equals uh, 9803, what happens after one iteration, two iterations, and three iterations. And it shows uh, the percentage of the errors out of the 134 errors in this design that remain after one or two or three inter iterations. We choose particularly this small value of R so that we can demonstrate this with, uh, with exhaustive uh, simulations. And what we can see is that with more iterations, the graphs are actually pushed to the left. So, so uh, the, there are less and less remaining errors, but 
the black graph with 40, so if we just uh, um, generate a wiki with 40 set bits in the beginning and the rest is randomized, then we can see that there are less number of corrected uh, errors. And this means that uh, these type of keys actually behave differently in terms of the DFR. And this is why we call them weak keys. And we said that not all keys are generated, uh, uh, are born uh, equal. And that's the difficulty. So, so we know that there are weak keys. The number, we computed the number, so it's a, it's a very large number, but it's still negligible compared to the total number of all keys. So the chance to fall on such a key, so okay, if you have the Fujisaki Okamoto transform, you cannot really computationally uh, try to uh, to build the ciphertext that fall, falls on, on, on these uh, keys. You can only hope that the original key was drawn this way, but the chance is... Uh, is uh, very small, uh, at least from, from the set that, uh, that we built. But this is uh, like a red flag that shows that uh, you have to be very careful about experimental DFR because these anomalies are not necessarily revealed in simulations if they are very rare. And the hope is actually that they are very rare. So unless there are sufficiently many wikis, and you have the Fujisaki Okamoto transform, you don't care about this. If the DFR is believed to be 2 to the minus 128, then of course you don't have a problem with these keys. Um, but if the DFR is only estimated to be 2 to the minus 128, then you need to argue about them. And finally, none of this is actually a problem with ephemeral keys. And we always uh, recommend to use ephemeral keys for forward secrecy. And this is an orthogonal uh, uh, problem. So the bottom line is uh, we have a methodology to estimate the DFR with an extrapolation. Um, uh, there are weak keys. Luckily, uh, the relative size is negligible. Uh, but uh, we have to be careful with anomalies that uh, do not affect the experimental DFR significantly. So a lot of, uh, a large, a huge number of experiments need to be carried out in order to rule out or to, to believe that you rule out these anomalies. And um, with the Fujisaki Okamoto transform, um, an adversary cannot really uh, concoct poisoned uh, cipher text and hopefully the wikis uh, are not uh, are not there and uh, i'll conclude with that bike is the best thing since uh, sliced bread and thank you very much thank you thank you shy